welcome to epg paathshala paper name is methodology of research in sociology module name is scaling and measurement in this module we'll discuss the significance of measurement of social data scaling methods of scaling and as part of different methods of scaling we we'll look at gutman scaling Thurston scaling, Likert scaling. Apart from this, we will also look at the different levels of measurement, like nominal measurement, ordinal measurement, interval measurement, and ratio measurement. Scaling and measurement become very significant in quantitative research. In quantitative research, we try to quantify the social data thus arriving at numbers becomes a challenging task for the social scientist we will discuss these aspects in this module in our daily life we rely on different types of standardized tools of measurement for example a petrol dispensing machine in a petrol bunk measures the volume of petrol we ask for. A shopkeeper uses a weighing machine to measure the required quantity. In the case of measuring temperature, thermometer is used which is believed to be a standardized instrument. Similarly, height, distance and a whole lot of other things which are part and parcel of our daily life are measured using standardized instruments. However, measuring social behavior which includes attitudes, perceptions, preferences or opinions is difficult because of its complexity. It is complex because social behavior cannot be precisely explained or reduced to certain causal factors. For example, preferences of voters towards candidates in elections are conditioned by several factors like voters' awareness levels, socio-economic background of the voter, profile of contesting candidates, parties and so on. Hence, it is difficult to single out a, a factor for preference of a particular candidate by a specific voter. However, through an intensive and scientific exercise, researcher may be able to explain the attitude of voters in a particular constituency towards contesting candidates. This is possible through a set of statements which is carefully worded and ordered in a scientific manner. Scaling therefore helps in assessing the attitudes or opinions of respondents with a higher degree of accuracy. Let us look at the meaning of scaling. The process of arriving at a set of statements to measure attitude, opinion or perception is known as scaling. Scaling may be defined as the arrangement of objects to numbers according to a rule. Here the objects refer to textual statements concerning attitudes or opinion. The reason for the use of a set of statements is simple. For example, a single statement like, do you want a woman contestant to be elected as Sarpanch of your village? The respondent may say yes or no or prefer not to respond. At the most, the responses can be categorized further on agree-disagree continuum as strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree cannot say and assess the intensity of opinion. However, this single statement may not reflect the opinion of the respondents with a greater accuracy. In order to know the intensity of attitudes of the respondents, not just about a woman serpent, as in the example given now, but his or her opinion in general about women as elected representatives, we may use a set of carefully selected and ordered statements. Scale also helps researchers to explain the intensity or magnitude of attitudes or opinions in numerical form. In other words, scaling refers to assignment of objects to numbers according to a rule. If we arrange three statements in a particular order, they read like this. Do you favor women contesting elections? Do you vote for a woman candidate in Sarpanch elections? Do you accept your wife or daughter contesting elections for the position of Sarpanch of your village? If you take this example, these statements are ordered in such a way that a respondent who agrees with the third statement is inferred to be in agreement with the rest of two statements preceding it. Thus, 
The respondent's score on a three-point scale is 3 out of 3, indicating a strong favorableness towards women participation in elections. When the same scale is administered to 100 respondents, the attitude of the particular group of respondents may also be expressed in numerical figure. For example, if 40 out of 100 respondents score 3 points each, 30 respondents score 2 points each, and another 30 respondents score 1 point each, in all the score for the group is 210. Hence, the average value for 100 respondents would be 2.1, indicating a moderate favorableness towards women participation in politics. Similarly, opinions or attitudes on complex social issues may be assessed using a scale. The discussion so far clearly suggests that a scale contains a set of questions, which are also called as statements or items. As mentioned earlier in the discussion, attitudes or opinions are complex and measuring them using a single question or statement is difficult to assess. If the objective is to measure the class status of respondents, for example, and a statement is made as state your annual income, it would yield responses which may help the researcher to make an assessment of economic status of the respondents and place the respondent in the appropriate class category. However, if the researcher wants to know the class, surely income alone would not be sufficient to make the assessment. Hence, a set of statements ranging from annual income, education, occupation to household expenditure may yield near sufficient information to place the respondent in the appropriate class category. This leads us to important aspect of scaling, that is dimensionality. The first statement refers to measuring a respondent's economic status on a single dimension and the later example refers to measurement on multiple dimensions. Attitudes and opinions are the outcomes of a complex web of social factors which cannot be assessed through single statements. This calls for employing a scale containing multiple statements. Scale also helps to test a hypothesis. For example, the hypothesis on the relationship between class and attitude towards women in politics can be tested using a scale developed to elicit the attitudes across class categories. Over a period, the attitude scales were evolved with the contributions from social scientists as well as psychologists. Since scaling was applied in 1930s in the West, sociologists and social psychologists have developed hundreds of scales to measure attitudes and to assess the latent dimensions of human personality. A scale consists of a set of statements which are in most cases expressed in the form of questions. The items in a scale are arranged in an order decided by the researcher following the established procedure of scaling. In other words, it suggests that the items in a scale are not placed arbitrarily. Let us look at the response scale. The responses on each item are collected using a response scale. A response scale is different from scale for the fact that while the response scale is used to help the respondent to choose one among many possible responses on a particular question, a scale measures the attitude or opinions on the issue as a whole. The response scale refers to the alternatives provided for a given question in the questionnaire or schedule. The response categories in the response scale do not by themselves measure the attitude or opinion of the respondent, but it is used to allow the respondent to choose one among the given alternatives based on the degree or intensity of his or her response. A close-ended question has a set of response alternatives presented to the respondent in an order. The order of response alternatives could be either in increasing or decreasing order. The response alternatives could be given in three ways. One, the response alternatives are autonomous in their meanings. They indicate complete meaning without overlapping into the next. The response alternatives are mutually exclusive for example, response alternatives on residential status could be urban, semi-urban or rural. Two, the response alternatives could be partially autonomous. For example, very much, somewhat, a little, not at all or agree strongly, agree somewhat, neither agree nor disagree, disagree somewhat, disagree strongly. Third, the third kind of response alternative could be used to measure the intensity of response on a continuum moving from left to right or right to left. The intensity could be quantified in numerical terms on a scale of 1 to 7 or 1 to 10. 
then let us look at the different types of scaling over a period of time different researchers have developed a variety of scales of which three are popular for their validity and reliability they are thurston scaling likert scaling and gutman scaling let us look at thurston scaling first it is the most widely used method of scaling its procedure is used to develop scale items to measure attitudes it was developed by ll thurston in 1920s it is also known as equal appearing scale and judgment scale it is a unidimensional scale because it measures aggregate attitude towards a specific issue in this scale thurston attempted to devise a method that would represent the attitudes of a group on specific issue in the form of frequency distribution the baseline indicating the whole range of attitude gradation from the most favorable at one end to the least favorable at the other end with a natural zero in between let us look at the procedure adopted in constructing thurston scale first focusing on the objectives of the research a number of statements are prepared these statements are reflective of attitudes about the issue that is studied statements cover an entire range of attitudes including positive negative and neutral they may range from extremely favorable attitude towards an issue to extremely unfavorable attitude neutral statements also form part of the set of statements the researchers are encouraged to develop as many statements as possible important point to be considered is that the statements should be brief and unambiguous and relevant second After a careful editing the statements are numbered and cut into uniform slips of paper a large number of judges who are quite familiar with the issue being researched are selected then the judges ask to sort the complete set of statements into piles there could be 7 or 11 or whatever the number researcher devises these piles for example ranging from 1 to 7 represent attitude ranging from extremely favorable to extremely unfavorable each judge based on his or her discretion places each slip of paper containing a statement into one of the piles for instance a statement which is reflective of a favorable attitude is placed on one two or three piles one being extremely favorable the judges are not supposed to express for instance a statement which is reflective of a favorable attitude is placed one two or three piles which are more close to favorableness the judges are not supposed to express their opinion but arrange the statements as objectively as possible on on the scale which is nothing but a continuum from extremely favorable to extremely unfavorable this is considered as the most important step in the construction of thurston scale third after sorting the statements by judges the researcher evolves a table to determine the number of time each statement is included in several piles fourth then the scale value for each statement is determined by computing the median and interquartile range fifth the next step concerns with the selection of certain statements for the final scale one statement for each median category with low interquartile range is selected on a scale of 11 as many statements are selected and arranged arbitrarily thus researcher arrives at the final formal scale to measure the attitude of respondents ranging from extremely favorable attitude to extremely unfavorable attitude towards an issue finally the scale is administered to the respondents based on their response that is in agreement or disagreement with statements a value for each respondent is obtained then we we'll look at the likert scaling Likert scaling was developed by Rensis Likert in 1932. This is also referred to as the method of summated ratings because a respondent score is computed by summing the response values. It is like marks obtained by a student in a test. It is a unidimensional scaling method. It is the most widely used scaling technique to assess attitudes. Likert scale needs a minimum of two categories such as agree and disagree. To know the degree of intensity it may further be divided into 5 or 7 point response scale let us look at the procedure in developing the likert scale similar to the procedure we have studied in the generation of thurston scale likert scale construction also begins with generating a number of statements relevant to the issue to be researched a group of judges are asked to rate the items usually on a 1 to 5 rating scale where 1 reflects strong favorableness to the concept whereas 5 reflects strong unfavorableness to the concept 
In the next step, through calculation of correlation between the statement and the total score, a set of statements is selected. Those statements having high correlation with the total score are selected. Thus, Likert scale is developed. The scale is administered to the respondents who are asked to rate their responses on 1 to 5 scale, 1 indicating strong disagreement and moves further to 5 which indicate a strong agreement. The respondents attitude towards the concept of study is assessed by looking at the total score for the scale. The total score for the respondent on the scale is the sum rating for all the items. Using the Likert scale, Edward O. Lawman attempted to test similar status hypothesis and higher status hypothesis in his study. He collected data from 450 respondents belonging to high, middle and low class categories located in three towns in the US. This study was conducted in 1965. Using the 5 point rating scale, respondents were asked to give their preferences for different occupational categories in terms of their agreement or disagreement. All the responses were summated according to the class category and Lawman tested the hypothesis and Lawman tested the two hypotheses. Then let us look at Gutman scaling. Gutman scaling is also known as cumulative scaling or scalogram analysis. It comprises a set of statements or items that are arranged in an order in the fashion of a flight of steps. It suggests that an affirmative response to any given statement implies an affirmation of the preceding statements. For example, if we take a set of questions like, would you be willing to accept a black person as visitor to your country? Would you be willing to have a black person living next door to you? Would you be willing to make friendship with a black person? Would you be willing to marry a black person? A respondent who is willing to marry a black person is presumed to be accepting it. Gutman's scalogram collects response categories as yes or no, agree or disagree for each item. The affirmative responses are given 1 for positive and 0 for negative response. The respondent's score is obtained by summing up the score for all the items. As in the case of other scaling procedures, the construction of Gutman scaling involves different phases. The first phase, items in the form of questions are generated based on the concept under study. Each item must be given two options, an affirmative that is agree and negative that is disagree. Items must cover the whole range of the underlying attitude continuum. In other words, items must move from simple agreement to overwhelming agreement. A group of judges rate the statements in terms of their favorableness or unfavorableness towards the concept. They then review the items and select final scale items. It is suggested that in constructing a, a scale, for example, to gauge progressive or conservative attitude in politics, the researcher will not only have to draw up a series of statements covering various fields, but will also have to construct statements that cover the whole spectrum from extreme radical to extreme reactionary. The next phase is administering phase, wherein the scale consisting of a set of statements is administered to the respondents. The respondents are asked to check items with which they agree. The analysis phase involves analysis of responses to statements. Each scale item, that is statement, is assigned a scale value and the attitude of respondent is computed by summing up the scale values of each item with which the respondent is in agreement with. Then let us look at measurement. Along with theory and method, equally important aspect of social research is data collection. Empirical studies involve data collection using either qualitative or quantitative method or sometimes both. Data collection exercise using survey method aims at recording the properties of objects with the help of a questionnaire or an interview schedule. Each question in the questionnaire or schedule aims at measuring the properties of objects of research. The objects refer to respondents and properties refer to the characteristics, opinions, attitudes of respondents. For example, age is a property which is measured in terms of years. Similarly, sex is a property measured as female, male or others. The properties of objects are measured using variables derived from concepts. Some properties are fixed and some are varying in intensity. For example, the property of marital status is 
either married, widowed, divorced or unmarried. It can only be one status. However, there are certain properties which can be measured in terms of their intensity. Thus, the term variable is used to refer to object properties conceived as varying in quantity or magnitude. For example, an individual can have more or less income. Properties are measured at four levels, namely nominal, ordinal, interval and ratio levels. The process of measurement involves recording the values assigned to the property of objects. Values may be numerical, alphanumerical or alphabetical. Those properties which are fixed are referred to as attributes, whereas those which vary are called as variables. For example, sex is an attribute while income is a variable. Let us consider the characteristics of different levels of measurement and the guiding factors in choosing a particular level of measurement. Nominal level of measurement. This is the most basic measurement type. In the construction of nominal scale, the objects with similar properties are placed in one class. In nominal level of measurement, the objects are classified into categories which are mutually exclusive. It has a minimum of two classes. All the objects must be placed in any one of these classes. If an object cannot be placed in any class, it indicates that the nominal scale is incomplete. There is no order implied. It involves counting of the frequency of the cases and thus mode is the suitable statistical measure for nominal level of measurement. In nominal level of measurement, the values are used merely labels. These labels may be alphabetic, alphanumeric or numeric. For example, rural or urban, sometimes these two options are assigned numbers as 1 and 2, say rural 1 and urban 2. Although numbers are used in some situations, they carry no significance and act merely as labels. The number labels should not be manipulated by adding, subtracting, multiplying or dividing. Ordinal level of measurement. In the ordinal level of measurement, the properties of the objects can be rank ordered. In other words, the responses in terms of preferences, choices or rank along the continuum of the characteristic being scaled. For example, students' preferences for universities in the country can be collected on a rank order of 1 to 5, 1 being the most preferred university to 5 being the least preferred university. Here, the researcher will be able to know the order of preferences but doesn't know about the intensity of such preferences. The difference between the preferences on a continuum of 1 to 5 is 1, but it doesn't mean that the difference between them is 1 exactly. Thus, the numerical 1 has no arithmetic significance. For example, we cannot say that difference between the choice of a university X, which is ranked 1, and university Z, which is ranked 4, though the difference is 3, but it doesn't mean that, for example, we cannot say that the difference between the choice of university X which is ranked as 1 and the university Z ranked as 2 is 1 because here 1 is not used in arithmetic sense. Similar to that of nominal scale, in ordinal scale objects which have the same quantity are placed in the same class. In the construction of ordinal scale, objects are compared to a common property. The rule of asymmetry applies here. In other words, the objects are ranked in terms of their properties. If object A has more of a property than object B, then object B cannot have more of the property than object A. The order of objects cannot be reversed. The rule of transitivity is also applicable in ordinal ranking. It suggests that if object A has more of a property than object B and if object B has more of a property than object C, then object A has more of the property than object C. This rank order relation persists through the scale. Mostly objects are ranked in terms of numbers for their position of a common property. For example, number 1 represents the object which possesses more of a property than the other objects. Similarly at number 2 and so on. Thus, all the objects are ordered. Although numbers are used to rank the objects in terms of their position of property, they do not signify any arithmetic meaning. For example, if object A is ranked 1 and object B 2, it doesn't mean that the difference between these two is exactly 1. It only implies the more or less of the property but doesn't explain the intensity or magnitude of the difference.
Thus, the intensity or magnitude of differences between objects cannot be explained using ordinal scale. Positional statistics such as median, quartile can be determined using ordinal data and order correlation can be determined with ranked data using Spearman's row. Then, let us look at interval level of measurement. This has the advantage of specifying the degree of difference between objects. The interval level of measurement suggests that the distance between the ranked objects has some meaning. The interval between the ranked preferences is equal. Interval level of measurement not only tells the order of objects but also the distance between them. This is possible because of the utility of numbers used here. The numbers are used in such a manner that they imply the extent of interval between order indicating the degree or magnitude of difference between different objects. Thus, the difference between 1 and 2 is considered to be equal to the difference between 2 and 3 and so on. It is possible to add, subtract a constant to the scale values without affecting the form of the scale. For example, if the scale values for preference in a general knowledge test for students are 4, 8, 12, 16 and 20, it may be surmised that the respondent X who scored 16 is said to have scored 8 points more than the respondent Y who scores 8. However, the basic limitation of interval scale is that it has no true zero point. Hence, we cannot infer that the respondent X who scored 16 is twice knowledgeable than Y who scored 8 because of the fact that knowledge has no true zero point. Other example of this type is ranking nations on human development index. In interval level of measurement, the zero is an arbitrarily selected point. Ratio level of measurement. It is the highest level of measurement. It has a true zero or absolute zero that is meaningful. This means that we can subject this to arithmetic calculations like multiplication and division. For example, if two cities A and B are located at a distance of 200 and 400 kilometers respectively from the city X, we can say that the distance between X and B is twice that of X and A. This can also be expressed in the form of an equation that is B is equal to A. We were able to express this in the form of an equation because distance has a true zero. Ratio level of measurement is amenable for many statistical calculations. Look at the figure provided to you which gives the details of the different levels of measurement, their characteristics with examples and permissible statistics. So far in this module, we have discussed the issues concerning scaling and measurement. We have looked at the meaning of scaling, different types of scaling. We also looked at the different levels of measurement and how social phenomena can be measured. Social scientists greatest challenge is to transform attitudes, opinions, perceptions into quantities. Measurement becomes reliable and valid when we convert the social data into numbers. The process of arriving at numbers has been discussed in this module so far.